For 40 years, we have been lied to about women and men, about domestic violence, about sexual assault, about privilege, about rights, even about the very idea of equality. Erin Pitsy, who founded the world's first internationally recognized battered women's shelter, has known all along that something's wrong because she witnessed the change herself back in the early 1970s. Today, she talks to many younger men and women who have been hurt by hateful and dishonest gender ideology, and she has a question for them. When did you wake up? And how long have you been awake? And of course, what should we do about it now? Welcome to When Did You Wake Up with Erin Pitsy and her co-host, Dean Esme. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the Saturday, January 17th episode of When Did You Wake Up with Aaron Pitsy. I, as usual, am Aaron's co-host, Dean Esme. How are you this evening in London, Aaron? Freezing, absolutely freezing. We're going to have Arctic weather for the whole of this week. So it's definitely pots of tea and lying under the duvet. Well, there's worse fates. <laughs> <laughs> I got to sleep in today, and of course, it's still early afternoon here. Mm -hmm. So, before we bring our guest on, Aaron, uh, we have a few updates on whiteribbon.org. I wanted to let people know that um, whiteribbon.org has just published uh, a, a, one of Aaron's classic essays called A Terrorist in the Family, which is one of the best articles on um, uh, domestic abuse that, frankly, that I've ever read. It is a classic. And uh, uh, tell us a little bit about that article, Aaron. Well, essentially, it was an amalgam of uh, work that I did, particularly when I was working in the refuge. And one of the things that always struck me about women's violence is in many ways it's very different from men. Men tend to be extremely explosive and very upfront, but many of the women in the refuge had what I called it, you know, a terrorist approach to violence. So getting them to accept that they weren't victims, but that I used to say that I'm not interested in the bomb that exploded. What interests me is the hand behind the bomb. And that's how terrorists operate, whether it's, you know, in Paris or in, in behind closed doors, but there is a specific way. So it really was a, a mug of everything I felt and saw about a certain type of terroristic women. And the frightening thing about terrorists is that when they move in out of the front door, they become lawyers and they go into the judiciary, police, caring agencies, and they behave exactly the same way. And, and there's no screening for people who essentially have personality disorders. And they can wreak havoc wherever they are, not just in a personal relationship. So I think it's an important document for people to read. I have shown this 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 to men and had them just gobsmacked, saying, "How did she manage to describe my wife, or how did yes. she manage to describe my mother so well?" Well, uh, all I can tell you is, you know, there's an old adage. I think it may be an American as well, but it's an English uh, cliche, really. Before you marry a woman, have a look at her mother. <laughs> And this is the next thing I'll be writing for uh, White Ribbon, is, is mother damaged men, because that's another huge subject. That's right. The world is uh, full of information for battered women, who, of course, do exist and do have a problem as well. Um, but some of this stuff, a lot well, of men... Very, there's an enormous amount written about men, or if you like, written about writing off men. We know what we do to men. We stuff them in prison. Or, you know, we inject them full of, of medicines. But when it comes to women, it's sacred territory. And the idea that 
the, it is mostly women who abuse children. It is women who create serial murderers. It's women who create rapists. It's very rarely discussed openly, and it needs to be discussed. Because if, as I believe, domestic violence is generational, it isn't a question of blaming. It's a question of educating and then showing people that they have an alternative. And a way to heal. That's exactly right. And I know that we're also planning soon to, on, or that you're also planning um, to publish uh, a reprint, an old article of yours called "When Did You Last Beat Your Wife?" We haven't it's put when that, did you last stop beating your wife? The idea is that, of course, all men beat their wives. Do you see that? And the thing of the, this was for the Observer, it's, so it's it's an, it's an old article. It's it's the first time I ever got anything published. I think it's 1989. Or 98, sorry, 98. And it's, it's sad to see, if you read it to the end, how little has actually changed. Although I will say that the whole concept of generational domestic violence, first headlined in A Voice for Men, I might add, and talked about at your conference for probably the first time ever, no one has talked about generational family violence. And this has always been what we should have been looking at, and we haven't. And we've been massively failed by very, very virulent, evil, radical feminists who simply, quite cynically, wanted money and used very fragile women and children to raise the money that they have now. Part of what org is there to address. So everybody look uh, for not only the new article that we've just caught up on there called The Terrorist and the Family, but in the next day or three... We should also have, when did you last, give me the title again, Aaron. Beat your, your Wife. When did you last beat your wife? I haven't read it yet. I can't wait to see it once it does get published. And um, I think that's enough news for whiteribbon.org, at least for this week. Although, weren't you telling me you're still working on some, th- some project with some researchers that is an alternative to the Duluth model? Yes, I'm, we, just, we, we are. We are this, uh, it's... it's uh, Karen Woodhall and myself, we're looking to, at a complete alternative treatment program, WHEEL, and it hopefully in time will com- replace the Duluth model, which actually is, is criminally offensive to men. Uh, awesome. Well, I can't wait to see or hear more about developments in that as we progress. Okay, everybody. Well, be sure to visit whiteribbon.org and tell everybody about it. It's a free site full of free information, stuff that the establishment in general doesn't want you to hear. And it's a problem that they don't want you to hear it because if you don't hear and know this information, you cannot make the problem of domestic violence worse. Chivalry won't cut it anymore, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we've got to start taking everybody, all victims seriously and all perpetrators seriously. So with that all out of the way... Baron, this week our special guest is Robert Mm O'Hara. A little bit of I know about Robert O'Hara. I believe you did meet at the International Men's uh, Conference on Men's Issues in Detroit uh, last year. Uh, Robert, I know uh, he is the host of the O'Hara News and uh, editorial radio show on Voice for Men Radio. He at one time was associated with Save Services, run by Ed Bartlett, although he's moved on and he does most of his work on a Voice for Men now. Um, Robert, are you with us? Yes. Hi. How's everybody doing? Bob, is Bob pretty good? Is Bob yes. good? I'm good. All right. Bob is okay. We'll call you Bob. Okay. And um, so we'll just go ahead and kick it off uh, with our usual um, Bob, when did you wake up? What caused you to start questioning what the heck people were telling you or thinking that what people were telling you about men, women, relationships, etc. just wasn't so? That, you know, I, I have been ruminating over this question for the past several days trying to think of what I'm going to say because there was no single epiphany. Um, and I don't think I'm unique in this at all. I think lots of lots of people um, – it's a gradual process with a lot of people, but really it, it was over a lifetime and it wasn't until around 2009, uh, that I decided, um, that, well, that I needed to do something, but really the process started, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but it kind of started in my, in my childhood. 
when um, I, as the youngest of, of six kids, uh, in a very healthy, stam- stable family, um, looked around me. I was born in 1971, and that's when the divorce rate started skyrocketing through the roof. That was uh, that was the year uh, that 50 percent of this, when 50 percent of all marriages failed after five years. That's when that started, and it stayed there ever since. So I grew up <clears throat> in a um, in a world where half of my friends uh, had had stable homes, and the other half didn't. And as a kid, I was incredibly perplexed by this. I, I was obsessed with trying to understand why is it my parents were, were different from or, or why is it my family was different from these other families where, you know, there, there was no reason for it to be that way, at least that I could see at that age. And um, so it was um, it really up right up until early adulthood, I was kind of perplexed by that. And, um, you know, of course, you, you go through life, you, you grow up and you you go to school and uh and you know, graduating from high school and then in my early 20s that's when i really really started um that, that's when slow doses of the red pill as we call it started seeping into my mind um but i'm assuming bob is that as you were uh 1971 so you were sort of born into the already into the into the emerging women's movement so through well, school and presumably in college you were very aware of the feminist movement. Oh, sure, yeah. Did you accept yeah. all that? I, you know, when when you're a kid, you just you kind of accept yeah. a lot of things that that you're yeah. told by adults. And uh, how? What and, was your mother's attitude, for instance, towards the movement? Well, <sighs> were your family traditional? Very much. Very well. Mm-hmm. In, in in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. My my parents were both come from a very strong Catholic background. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> they they married young. They got married in 1962. They're still married today. Um, they had, uh, a lot of kids, uh, not intentionally though. They, um, uh, they had four kids that they, they finally had a, a boy. They wanted a boy. They had three girls before that. And then my mom went on the pill mm-hmm. this is back in the day when, uh, and I remember my mom, uh, telling me that she was really angry because when she went to go get the pill, that she went to a Catholic doctor cause there was a, we were in a Catholic health system yeah. and, the, uh, and the, the doctor asked her, uh, if she had permission from my dad, <laughs> my yeah, mom was very I, upset with this. She was no, like, but that, that, that is how it was. Just, yeah. yeah. Well, it's uh, unfortunately that's the way when men when men go to get vasectomies today. Oftentimes they have to get the they have to get consent from, from their wife. Yeah. It's the same yeah. thing. <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah. Um, but um, but uh, so um, but she she went on the pill, and unfortunately this is back when the when uh, the pill the progesterone of the pill was way higher than it is now. Yeah. And she, it, it made her very ill. And, um, and so she went off the pill and of course when that happens, uh, she became ultra fertile. Um, and, uh, I guess mom and dad had one too many drinks one night and had a little fun and, and then my twin brother and I were born. <laughs> so they went from four, four kids to having six kids. So my, my family, and we were all within nine years of each other. So I, I remember growing up in my house when I was a kid, it wasn't, when we were younger, there wasn't much talk of politics. There was a lot of chaos going on. <laughs> so it was, um, you know, people say, oh, so you come from a traditional background, as if as if being coming from a large Irish family was, you know, as if it were a quiet affair or something quaint. It wasn't. It was completely chaotic. So um, I had a, a marvelous childhood and a marvelous upbringing, but it was um, not smooth going. Uh, was for, she home? Was she home most of I, the time? My, oh, no, 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 no. My, both my parents had to work because they, they had kids to feed. Uh, yeah, and right. They maintained a, a very good lifestyle for for us. I'm, I'm, mm. I marvel at my parents and their their ability to sacrifice for their children because we always had a, a we always lived in a decent house. We always we were always were well fed and clothed. But right around the time I was um, really from the time my oldest sister was old enough to to basically keep us from playing with matches and burning the house down. Mm. Um, my mom went back to work and she was a nurse. She was an RN uh, and she practiced for 40 years. And so mm. she worked nights, she worked hard, and, and my dad worked very hard too. He was in the transportation industry for a long time. And um, so uh, it was it was just one of those things where mom worked not because she felt that she she, she – uh, was being the liberated woman being liberated from her family. No, she worked because she, like my dad, had to work. Yeah. My 
it's had to work. Yeah. So it wasn't like that. It, it wasn't. It wasn't like oh, uh, I'm an emancipated woman now. I, I, I'm I'm working. Mm. No, it's because she had she she had to she had to put the the yoke around her neck just like my dad, and they had to they had to raise a, a family of six kids. I know. So that wasn't um, that, and that was uh, uh, that that had an effect on on the way I, I saw relationships, and mm-hmm. it was um, and it was different from the way most people I think my age as they were growing up saw mm-hmm. their um their family and their mother and their father uh my, as i grew up when i when i think of my parents i think about people who who sacrificed and who who worked hard and it was not easy uh there and of course there was tensions and there were fights and stuff like that but that's normal mm. um but i'm i'm very thankful for that but it, but i always had the sense that that made me very much different from amazingly from from m- m- a lot of the kids that I grew up with, a lot of a lot of people that I grew up with, in the same, who are my same age, and even now, as I talk with people my same age, it's um, the, the the story. It, of course, everybody's different, but I just I just had this weird sense that you know I had these two two parents who who stuck together through thick and thin. I mean, just the mm. things they went through, and I just had the feeling that made me different from a whole lot of people whose parents never would have stuck together through even if if they went through a fraction of the the adversity that my parents went through. So seriously, talking to uh, people who are now who who experience single parent living, then uh, is what you're yes. saying. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, it is very different. I've been a single parent, so I know sure. how yes. different it is. And I remember and then, going. Yeah, I remember going to my friend's house who were uh, there. They had, it was a single parent home, and and it wasn't it wasn't as happy. It wasn't. Uh, well, no, because I mean, any single parent, male yeah. or female, is mostly absolutely exhausted, and yes. you can't father. You can't. You, a mother can't father, and a father can't mother. So when you do go to single parent homes, and it's obviously ninety percent mothers, you can you can notice the difference. Oh yeah, and I, and I even even as a kid, I I, I noticed it. Um, it was, what did it make you feel about your future? About my future at the time, well, when you're a kid, you don't. No, I was thinking well, older because you're in your twenties now. Okay, in my twenties. My twenties. When I when I, uh, uh, you know, I, when I graduated from high school, I, I went to, to college for one year and dropped out because um, I just wasn't interested in it. And then I I decided to. I tell people I I ran away and joined the circus. I got into show business, mm-hmm. and what I wanted to do was was be a sound guy. And I still make my living doing that now, for the most part. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um. And uh, I you know, started traveling around, started working for different production companies. And my future at that at that point in my life was: there's no way I'm getting married and doing this because mm-hmm. I was scared to death of because I, because as I grew up, I saw just the the misery of, of single parent households and, and what people went through with divorce and how angry kids were mm-hmm. when their parents went through divorce and just what it did. Because um, I I grew up in the divorce generation where yeah. for the first time kids were like their parents and just just the anger and, the, and just the anguish. And I thought to myself, I'm just not going to, to get married when I'm in this business, at least. Mm. At least not until I'm in my mid-30s. Um, that's why I was thinking back then, of course, now, of course, I'll never get married. I'm glad I didn't. Um, but uh, I, it, as far as the way I looked at my future, I was like, you know, this marriage thing is risky. And it's and it the, the divorce thing, and it's a 50% chance of divorce. And the destruction that it plays out on kids mm. is terrible. And mm. I just didn't want to have at that time, and even now I don't want to. Didn't want to have anything to do with it at the time. Mm. And uh, when I, um, as I was in my early twenties, uh, as a young adult, uh, all my friends that I went to high school with, they started getting married when they were young. I, mm. I went to high school in a rural area. Uh, we moved around a lot when I was a kid, but in my last three years of high school, I went, we moved to a rural area. And um, so, kids, people got married young there, typically. And you, know, you get these people get married when they're twenty, twenty-one years old. And after five years, in my mid twenties, a lot of these people were getting divorced, and then I saw it all over again. Except mm-hmm. it was like these were my friends, and just what, especially my my guy friends who went through divorce. Terrible, terrible, just horror stories of um, of false accusations of domestic violence, of having their children taken away from them, having to again through no fault of their own, having their kids taken away from them, having to pay child support, and all of a sudden they're broke. And they didn't do anything wrong, and they don't see their kids, and it's just you know, you know, guys trying to commit suicide, and 
and it was just a nightmare. And it just that so, kind of. Bob, as a matter of interest, what did you do about dating girls? Because you obviously weren't going to make any form of commitment. Oh no, I just I just dated girls. I didn't <laughs> I, I didn't actually become sexually active until I was in in my in, in my early twenties, mm. and uh, then uh, and it, of course when you're when you're in show business, you live a, a lifestyle that's a, a road lifestyle. You're on the road all yeah. the time, so you get your loving on the run, I guess. You know, and I and I, mm. I, I uh, in, in my early twenties, that's that's kind of how it was. You know, there was. Kind of the occasional lucky hookup, I guess you could say. Uh, I didn't really date anybody, but in my mid twenties, I did start. I, I did start seeing a girl, and um, I, I fell madly in love with her. Uh, and I didn't. I had never felt that way about anybody before. And everybody has this. Every everybody has a sob story like this. So I mean, you know, so I'm going to spare you all. The well, no, some, no, no. Well, no. Actually, Robert, an awful lot of people don't ever fall as you say, madly in love, because uh-huh. it isn't so much madly in love. Sometimes it can be madly into addiction, which is where men get into, and women, get into terrible trouble. Was this an addictive relationship or no, a happy? It was, no, it was, it was, it was uh, something that, um, it just something I stumbled upon. Uh, okay. I, I met a girl and we started seeing each other. Uh, we lived kind of far away from each other and I was, uh, and I, I, we, we both had feelings for each other, mm-hmm. and um, I was at the time because of this this business of uh, of seeing what happened to all my friends who had gone through divorce and, and growing up and, and and seeing all my my friends who had come from broken homes. I was I had this thing where I was like, oh, I you know I, I really have to kind of process this. I have to really kind of like wait. I think about like, am I going to have a future with this person? And, and I wasn't good at talking about it. I wasn't good at trying to explain it, even to myself, really. But, um, but she was, uh, she was ready. She was, she wanted to, uh, she made it pretty clear that she wanted to have kids. Um, and, uh, and she, um, she was ready and I, I was not. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the the relationship ended, and yeah. and my my big thing was is you know how can I possibly get married, doing what I do for a living and not having a a, a, a steady paycheck and a, and what what most people call a decent job I don't know what that means nowadays, but um you know but so anyway that, you, you you were very adverse to marriage anyway weren't you Yes I was I was. Mm. Uh, at the time, and then and then the relationship ended, and I was crushed. It was just like you know, it was like oh my god, and I I decided uh, that you know I was not going to, that if that ever happened again, mm. that I was going. And this is way back in my I was still very much blue pill back in these days. I I said to myself, there's no way I am ever going to if, if I find someone that I care about that much ever again that I'm going to let. Uh, anything stand in my way of of becoming uh, a good hubby, I guess you could say. So I yeah. decided back to school because um, I really thought at the time uh, that that was, you know, that, that was the thing. You know, you can't, you, you can't, because I, I grew up, you know, with, with a, a mom and a dad who were dedicated professionals in what they did and they, and they, 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 they rose, a, they, they raised a family and, and the, the finances were very important. And mm-hmm. it was it, someone had to take responsibility for that, and I there was no way at that point that I was even equipped to do that because I mm-hmm. did, at first I didn't even want to develop a, a career that would be conducive to to family life. Um, but now you know having at, at that point having gone through like a really it was, it was really devastating for a young man. Everybody goes through their first heartbreak; it's the worst yeah. thing. And it's it's normal. I mean, I'm still I'm, you know I got over it many years ago, but at the time it's just it's like the end of the world. And um, so I decided to go back to school, mm-hmm. and uh, and I got I went went back to school, got my degree in economics, and I was going to become I was going to become a company man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was going to get that white collar job, and I was going to get a steady paycheck, and that way, um, that way I would be happy. That's what I thought. Well, what what you what you're saying is that way you thought that you would be able to meet a woman and offer her the, what she wants: Correct. marriage and children. Yeah. Correct. I really felt that way yeah. at that time. That's, yeah. that's what I felt. Mm-hmm. And um, you and millions of other men. Sure, absolutely. 
And yeah. then now, now the cold reality. Tell me what happened next. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> Let's just, okay. This is really when actually this 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 whole going back to school thing is really the start of the process of truly yeah. making up. Yeah, uh, I, I went back to school, and of course, you know the 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 pain abated. Uh, the you know you, you get over it, and as I was going to school, I started. I started actually enjoying going to school, mm-hmm. and it became something different eventually. It became kind of like a journey in and of itself. Yeah, uh, I got my degree in economics from the University of Maryland, great school. Can I, I could, just ask you an historical sure. question? At that point when you were at university, did you actually see any of the kind of rabid oh, yes. fem- feminist stuff yes. that we see now? Absolutely. But there were, there were, it was it hysterical about rape as it is now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good it was Lord. just – yeah, here's the thing. I uh, – uh, when I went to school first, when I was like 19 years old, I yeah. uh, for a year I, I lost interest in it, dropped out, like so many people do. Uh, but there was a, a huge change. That was around 1990. Yeah. Uh, and I went back to school in 1997, mm-hmm. and there just seemed to be a huge change in that time period. It really struck me. It, there really seemed to be a huge change in the timbre campus, the, 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 mm-hmm. the, the environment mm-hmm. in regards to men, male mm-hmm. students. When I went back to school, I noticed that there was just this hostility. There mm-hmm. was a, it was a, it was a caustic environment for, for male students. There was a, it was a zeitgeist. Uh, there was, you know, you, you saw when, not about a year or two before I went back to school at the University of Maryland. They had had this thing where this is a famous case where they actually took random photos from the student uh, database mm. of men and, and put them on posters all over campus and said potential rapist. Oh, and, no. But it was terrible. I mean, yeah. you're these guys. Can you imagine if you're a guy walking down the quad with your backpack on and you know, you've never raped anybody, never wanted to rape anybody? It would be inconceivable for you to do so. And you see your picture on a poster that says potential rapist. So a bunch of male students that on campus got really angry about this and they, and they took them down. Um, uh, but that was when you really started seeing stuff like that. And I remember myself walking down the sidewalk and seeing their, you know, the women's studies department had all their students go out. This, the people actually got credit for this to write on the chalk in the sidewalk saying, you know, one out of four women are going to be raped in college and, you know, and, it just I mean terrible the whole like rape culture thing just started amping up around that time. Of course yeah. they didn't have the, the dear colleague letter like they do now. Now it's ten times worse. But back then it was like even then if you were a normal person like myself, like most people, mm-hmm. you, you, you got the sense that it was like, Hey, what this is ridiculous. Why why should I have to walk down the sidewalk and look at this? Why? This is not true, and this is clearly anti-male. It's clearly making it hostile for me to just go to school and learn. Um, but if if you tried to say it, if you even said anything about it, you're you're going to get shouted down. Uh, yeah. I remember there was um, and this and this affected people at people. This affects people academically, students academically. I remember I was taking a history course, and um, the the professor wanted us to do a paper on the witch hunts of the 17th century. And um, I, I wrote what I thought was a pretty good paper. Basically kind of my explanation was that there's always a witch hunt going on. There's always some, there's always some scapegoat. And I, I used as an example thinking that this would, would not be a problem. Thinking, well, you know, I just use an example. Look what's happening here on campus. You know, there's, there's a mm-hmm. witch hunt going. It's, it's like a, there's this hysteria against about rape. And there's, I mean, People aren't being – there's not a rapist behind every tree and, there, and like one in four women aren't being raped, clearly. And I thought that my, my professor was a reasonable person who understood this. You know, Male and or I, female? Uh, he was a male, male, right. male uh, professor, but the, the, the teaching assistant was female. She graded the paper. Okay. And I just put this in the paper. I said this is, this is an example of a witch hunt. Look, I mean there are witch hunts all the time. Mm. And, um, and I, I was naive. Back then, and thinking that you know, sh- surely just these crazy feminists, they, they, uh, you, you know, they, they're a small niche in the in the in the co- in the campus community. Not yeah. everyone takes them seriously. Well, she was. There's no way she was going to give me an A on that paper. And I got a C, and I was like, wait a minute, this is. I mean, the, the grammar was was perfect. I so I had a friend edit it for me, and everything was cited. It was pretty well written. 
how did I get a C on this paper? And I, and I approached this woman about it, and she said, well, you, I mean, what's this business you're talking about? Great. But I said, well, I mean, clearly this is a witch. And then she just went, she just went, the, the party line came right out of her mouth. That's a lie. You're lying. Going forward, I've got to be raped on campus. There's an epidemic going on, and you shouldn't say, I'm like, I, I was amazed. You know, here I am. I'm a 26-year-old kid, and mm-hmm. here's this, here's this, you know. This woman, she's about to get her doctorate, and she's screaming at me. And I'm going, what? what? And I, I was, I was stunned. I, and there was nothing I could do about it. There was, but nothing. that's presumably one of the waking up moments. One of them, yes. Because that is such a betrayal, and and it was oh, really absolutely. at that point. I remember all this because that point is when the beginning of making the campuses across the world, the Western world, hostile to young men. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, but of course, at the time. I was still I, I didn't I, I I didn't at that time I wasn't my mind wasn't bent towards activism because of this at the time I was like, okay, whatever, I have this yeah this I have this college professor, I'm just gonna forget about this thing, I'm gonna get my degree and it's all gonna be over. <laughs> I mean, are you dating at this point? <laughs> am I am I dating? Yeah, at that point. Oh at that point? No, I was not. Mm-hmm. At that point I was not. <clears throat> but um I uh, I when I when I went to when I went back to college I was very focused. I didn't I, I yeah, you, you got you got you, you got your degree. I, no, actually, no, that's not true. I was there. I, I did have a girlfriend at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, she was already graduated, um, but also but normal and not and not a radical feminist. She was not a radical feminist, but she was not normal. <laughs> oh, she was not normal. That was a that was a that was she was somebody that I I should have dumped maybe a year before I did. Um, and what's your learning curve? What's that? Was she a learning curve? Uh, did, you, I, did you recognize that, that this is something you've got to watch out for? Uh, at, at the time, no. Okay. Uh, but then I, I came to, to understand. Okay. Let's get there then. Yeah. Oh, okay. If you want mm-hmm. to. Uh, I, was, I was seeing this girl. Um, uh, you know, it's funny. I'm back back to, my, to my heartbreak. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was seeing this girl, and she, she was a high school acquaintance of mine. And... Um, she uh, 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 she kind of had a thing for me in high school, and I, I mm. like I wasn't really interested in, in dating when I was in high school. Uh, but uh, I I I met up with her, you know, well, I guess I was like twenty five, twenty six years old, and I was still getting over this this heartbreak. And I, I mm-hmm. thought maybe this is an opportunity to, to have a to see if I can actually because you know when when you're when you're this blue pill guy, you want yeah, to, to yourself. That, that you can be that guy who's who's you know can be a potential mate or whatever, and yeah. uh, and um, so I started dating this girl, and uh, she turned out to be pretty well. She was I I think she was um, borderline personality disorder. Uh, she's very very she very much into histrionics, very manipulative, and uh, fi- and I didn't take once I figured that out, I just dumped her like a hot potato. Um, I've well, that's been, lucky. Yeah, uh, I've, I've always been pretty healthy that way. I, yeah. I think the reason I'm that way is because my parents had such a normal, functional relationship. And there was no, uh, so, so you, in a way, you had a. This is the way you you're so much better off than so many men because you actually knew what normal was. Yes, see, an awful I, I, lot of, yeah. of 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 men or women coming from dysfunctional families, they don't know normal. Right. So abnormal is normal to them. Yes. And she probably felt completely outraged that you dumped her because she oh. has no idea that she was abnormal. Uh, yeah. Um, it's really sad. It, it, it was. I mean, it, but it was just, it, it was a relationship I was glad to be done with. <laughs> yeah, you were, yeah. And then you moved on. I did. I, I graduated, from, graduated from college. I was happy to have my degree. Um, and at, at that time, I was still like, okay, I'm in my, my late 20s now, almost 30. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I start up my career and I even at that time I I decided that I just wasn't going to get married it was just wasn't worth it or that I probably wasn't going to get married it wasn't worth it you know, I, was, I was still seeing it at every stage of my adult life really even now I see I'm seeing guys who are getting divorced and having their lives destroyed and their kids taken away from them. that's never stopped from the time I became hmm. an adult to right now and I suspect even in the future, I'm always going to have at least three or four friends who are going through divorce, and, and I have friends right now who are going through this. Mm-hmm. They're going through divorce, and, and they're they're 
they're, they're, they're the mothers of their children are not letting them see their kids. They're, they're, they're li- their fortunes are being taken from them. And it, it, do, it never gets any easier as I, as I grow older to see that. Um, but, but anyway, back, back to where chronologically speaking, yeah, graduating from college. And, and so I, for about two years, I was, it was, you know, in 2000 is when I graduated. That was a very difficult time to find a job if you were a college graduate, as it is now. <clears throat> and, um, so I, I was, you know, looking around, I was, I was living in DC at the time. And then I, I, I moved up t- to Baltimore, um, uh, and had a kind of a, a casual living arrangement, which might be handy to talk about a little bit later. But I, I decided to move to Baltimore because of a of a pretty sweet living arrangement that my brother had hooked me up with, um, and and was up there and, and still couldn't find work. And I was still working as a sound guy doing other th- stuff. And it was kind of like really depressed at this time because the only thing I wanted to do was get a, a real job. Mm. And finally, I got what I thought was a real job. And it was in higher education as an administrator. So I kind of went back into the, the whole college thing. Um, still, even even after my experience at, at uh, the University of Maryland, uh, it was still – I was still a bit naive about just how caustic the environment was on college campus. I didn't fully appreciate it until I started working in higher mm. education. And I was uh, – I worked in institutional research and what that is um, – is it's a uh, a branch of administration that um, collects data on the students, uh, retention, graduation rates, enrollment rates, student performance. The, the people who do the student satisfaction surveys. They used to write and administer and collect the data, and and analyze it and write the reports on it. That's what I did, and um, so I kind of had a front row seat on what I can comfortably say now is the war on male students in higher education. I saw firsthand yeah. the the administrative and the academic uh, policies in action and how they affected male students and how just how bad it was. I think most people don't understand just how bad it is. I don't think they do, Robert. The question I wanted to ask you is at this point – how, what would you say the ratio of male to female people were in the education system? Well, because women now virtually outgun all men in the administration. Abs- oh, in the administration, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the administration, <clears throat> I'd say mid-level administration. It's about it's about it's, it's about like the, the student population about sixty forty sixty percent women at that mm-hmm. time. I mm-hmm. think it's more women now. I think it's it more is. Like 35. But how? But even then, how would you say? I mean, how many of them would you say were radical feminists oh, with an agenda? Oh, oh, oh boy. Yeah, um, well, that's the question. Pretty much. I mean, it, it. Pretty much, the culture pretty much dictated that you know you had to have a feminist ideology. You well, you would much, get in. Oh, yeah. You, you'd oh, you'd get in big trouble. And there, I mean, I remember one uh, woman that I worked for. She had a a, a sign ab- above her desk that said. Um, if a tree falls in the forest uh, and there was only a man there to hear it, d- did it still happen? <laughs> Which was yeah. kind of like a, it's kind of like a quantum physics joke, you know. And then there was yes. like, you, you go, you you go um, uh, to, I mean, pretty much, in it, you 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 look at the the paraphernalia around in the in the uh, in the administration buildings and. Just the anti-male stuff people had on their desks and the, the stuff they talked about. It was just – it was open misandry. Yeah. Just open misandry, constant anti-male jokes, constant belittling of men. I mean just – I mean some of it just got quite bad and there was – and it was almost as if these women were drunk with power that they could do this. And, get, and if you were a man, if you even even question, even question this or even put up a front to it, you – you were going to get the furry eyeball. You were going to get. You were going to. There's. There was. You were. Your name was going to be on a list. You know. Mm-hmm. No one saw the list, but your name was on it. And I. I remember. Um, I was. I worked at two places. I worked at a community college. I worked at a four year school. Uh, and when I was, uh, about a, six months before I left the community college, they, even then they were they were talking about the um, the gender gap in education. Even then they were like, why. Why is it that that men are men are not coming into school, not staying in school, and and people would would discuss this because it was important, it was part of our job, mm. and you know you'd hear these things like, oh, it's because you know, I mean, 
most of the time I was like, well, you know, men just aren't equipped in, in the current new information world to do this. Or there, there was always something or, or like, you know, men just – Men are just behind. Men are just there's there's something there's something about men that just doesn't make them fit to be in an academic devi- environment. And of course, that's all anti male bullcrap. That that's yeah. all. And, and um, one time we were having one of these conversations in, in, in the office, and I just I just had to say something. I said, "Listen, look at the environment that men find themselves when they come to school. It's a hostile environment. Would you want to come to school here if you were a guy?" And uh, the, it, the the silence was deafening. <laughs> everybody is like, it's like everybody's jaw dropped and everybody looked at me. It's heresy. It, oh, absolutely. It was true heresy, what I said. Uh, and of course, I was a younger guy. I was impetuous. Um, and, but, but I was saying the truth. Yeah. I was like, someone's got to say this. And, and no one had an answer for me. Mm. But from that moment on, there was a cloud above my head. Um, and uh, I eventually left that job on, on good terms. Uh, I, I actually liked the people in that job. But there's a, there was a zeitgeist, you know, in, in yeah. higher education. You just, there's things you can't say. There are things you can't challenge. And it's a feminist ideology that you cannot challenge. It was true even then. You, this but but the thing, the most important thing I think to remember is that uh, it, it is precisely in, in the universities and community colleges across the Western world, this is the best place to to actually find young vulnerable men and women, not just women, and sure. brainwash them, absolutely. and that's why you were dangerous. Totally, total indoctrination. Absolutely, I was yeah. against this indoctrination plan that they all have. And um, but I went. I remember I went to a four year school after that, and this is where uh, this was another big uh, thing. I went to four year school after that, which was a uh, an engineering type school, um, very strong in the STEM fields. Uh, mm-hmm. Most people went there, but and it was it was one of the one of the shrinking number of schools at that time that was actually had a fifty percent, fifty one percent male population, male student population, where fifty one percent of the students were male. Mm-hmm. And I remember seeing that when I first got there. Of course, the first thing you do if you're institutional research, you get the numbers on the school, and you start you know getting familiar with the data and the layout lay of the land. <clears throat> And I remember going to uh, my boss and saying, "Wow, this is unusual. You actually have more more male students here." I mean, I was aghast. I was like, "Wow, yeah. I'm, a, I'm at a school where there are more male students, and more male undergraduates than there are female undergraduates. This is interesting. How did this happen?" You know, and uh, and you know, and she, and, uh, and I, I remember the response was, "Yeah, we're trying to change that." They actually said, "Oh that. no," and yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, no, not joking here. I know, no, like, no. Mm. I, I, I was, I was take, again, it was like one well, of the many ones I was taking back. I was going, are you kidding? Seriously? And um, I remember <clears throat> we were uh, – I was walking with my boss back from lunch, uh, and uh, and she was talking about this this initiative that they were starting in the um, in the engineering program. Uh, the engineering program was, of course, predominantly male, as they most most of the to- most often times are, mm-hmm. and. Um, and she said that they were going to get a grant from the government yeah. for $75 million mm-hmm. if they could make the uh, STEM fields at the school 50% female. And they were only going to get this money if they actually had 50% female enrollment in the STEM fields. $75 million dollars. Even for a, a university is a lot of money, and I said, and I just looked at her and I said, "Well, don't they understand that they're bribing the department heads to put male students at a disadvantage?" And she stopped dead in her tracks. She said, "Bob, don't ever let anyone else hear what you just said. Well, seventy-five good million advice. dollars, yeah, mm. seventy-five million dollars is a lot of money, and and I'm, I'm serious, Bob. Don't don't tell anybody what you just told me." Mm-hmm. And I was, I was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, Here it yeah, is I guess, again. I guess Here we if go I again. Keep my job, I mm-hmm. better not talk about these things. Mm-hmm. And um, so, <clears throat> so, and you know, it was just one of those moments where I went back and I sat at my desk and I'm going, what's what's going on here? This is terrible. And and it 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 just at that point it really 
tied in all these things I had been thinking about higher education for a while that there was actually a war going on against male students. But, but, but at any point, did, did you have men that you could talk to on the faculty, men, men who felt like you did? I, I talked with the – only, the only people I could talk with, frankly, about this kind of thing mm. were um, consultants that the school would hire to come in and do work, you know, IT work or whatever. Uh, but you, you, I mean, it just got to the point where I was warned a couple of times where like, you just don't talk about that stuff. Just keep your mouth shut, dude. Yeah. You know, you're, you're getting, you're getting a paycheck. Just go with the flow. Uh, Jonathan Taylor put it best. He said, there's a, there's a culture of careerism in higher education. Yeah. Uh, if you want to keep your job, you keep your mouth shut and you, yeah. you, you go with the flow because it's all about the money. It's all about, and, and the people in control and seriously, the feminists have taken absolute control over higher education system. Yes, yeah. and they had this hate-filled agenda, and they're just running with it. And yes. up until very recently, no one dared challenge them. Because well, they did, still haven't really. If if you did challenge them, and this is what happened to me, you're going to lose your job. Yeah. Or if you were an academic, even with tenure, you could lose all that. I mean, you you yeah. heard you hear these stories, what and you know, you know this story. You you know these you've heard about this. In the '70s, they started actually these academics academics actually started doing actual scientific studies on domestic violence and they found out lo and behold that it's not a gender issue it's it yes they've known ways. for years yeah. yeah and the people who actually did those studies and actually wrote those reports these were social scientists they were psychologists they didn't have a political axe to grind they were academics mm-hmm. those people were destroyed they got I know. death threats yeah got, that's murray it's, it's murray and all the people i know yeah and I've yeah. lost – I twice have been on the verge of bankruptcy because I kept writing what I was told not to write. We That's do right. know, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, and this – and um, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the the woman who was my direct su- supervisor at that job mm. um, decided she didn't like me uh, and um, – for for a lot of reasons, I was I was called misogynist, all this crap, and, and uh, well, you got very good reason. You were a red blooded normal male. Yes, I, exactly. That's a good exactly. enough reason and, to be. And hated. also, this is another another big thing in our higher education system. I was actually interested in going to work and doing something. Mm. Um, I'm not the the, uh, the ideal employee. Um, I you know I, I can slurch with the best of them, but but the, but at the end of the day, I like to think I accomplished something. It's just mm. it's it's how I was brought up. But I I value that. Um, and unfortunately, the, the culture in higher education, especially in the U.S., is a very parasitic culture. It's like mm-hmm. you're basically – your job is basically a paid vacation. And, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I went to work and I, I tried to work. I worked really hard at what I did. I took pride in my work and this, this individual uh, was very threatened by that. She didn't like the fact that I was raising the bar because she did a very unproductive person and I was – I, I, I've always thought myself to be of, of average productivity, um, but that was too much for her. So she kind of used this um, this business where I, I was, I, you know, just I was just simply some guy that wasn't particularly outspoken, but questioned these things openly. Mm-hmm. Well, she used that to build this narrative around me that I was misogynist and all that, and this all happened behind my back. I didn't realize how bad <clears throat> the call me had gotten, and you you never know when someone's slandering you until it's too late. Um, and, uh, um, and there was some sabotage of my work that I didn't realize until afterwards. And I basically, they, they asked me to leave and I said, okay, fine. This person doesn't like me, whatever. I'll just go and I'll find another job. Mm-hmm. Well, it wasn't that easy because what, what actually had happened is I had already been blacklisted from the entire education community. Yes. That's how they do it. That's exactly how it works. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then <laughs> on top of having my career destroyed, this woman actually took all, about nine reports that I had written over the nine months that I had been there, took my name off of them, put her name on them, and posted them on the website. <laughs> I was like, what is this? I cannot believe how pathetic this person is. And uh, so I, I wrote a letter to um, the uh, – I, I called up the the school and, and said, hey, look, this is what actually happened here. I can't get another job here because this woman has been trash-mouthing me. And look, she plagiarized my work. If this doesn't stop immediately, I'm going to get a lawyer. <clears throat> and um, of course, all the the reports I had written uh, were taken down from the website, never to be seen again. Uh, and um, she was demoted. Uh, 
but that but, but she wasn't fired, fired. no no, they didn't, no. Yeah. in any other industry she would be like what are you doing get the heck Absolutely. out of here and we're gonna yeah. give this guy his job back mm. uh, but that's not what happened um that's just the way it is when once you if you're a male in higher education and you've been tagged as as not as as being as being anti-female or being a misogynist it's or over just being you. honest or just being honest correct yeah. It's over for you. You're yes. not, and, and it took – and I, I remember it was a very dark period in my life because um, you know, when, you, when you go through a career, it wasn't just a normal career loss. It was really a, – a, it, a, it was a character assassination. Yes. And there were – and the fallout was, was immense. I had old uh, professors that I had developed very good friend, fr- friendships with mm-hmm. uh, over years that wouldn't talk to me anymore. I mean word gets around. Were they because it, well, they were frightened. Absolutely. I mean, when when you have one person that's, that and this this person was terribly frightened of me, um, uh, it, she she the the lengths to which she went to make sure. Yeah, but it, she didn't do it by herself. She oh no. Could, so that that's the most frightening part of there's it. There's a whole system set up. Well, that's for, right. For yes. Blacklisting. If, yes. If you, there's a whole. It it really is. Mm-hmm. It's a whole mechanism, and it works like a clock. You know, the only thing you have to do is point your finger at somebody and says and say misogynist, and their life is destroyed. Yeah, well, it's no different. It. The only different now is in Stalin's days, you'd have been marched off either to a gulag or executed. Yes. Yes. These days, you're blacklisted and you are then destroyed because you can't earn a living. Right, and that's what happened to me. And yep. I went through a very dark period in my life that lasted uh, a while. I I I couldn't get a job. I mm-hmm. I, had, I had worked for years to go back to school, put myself through school. And um, I, I, I had this job, I had this career that I really wanted. I really wanted a future, and I was going to go get my master's degree and possibly my doctorate. And and people, uh, there were I had I had friends and allies in in the in the in the business saying, you know, someday you're going to be a director. You know, you need people. Usually, men were who and, and men do this at work. You know, they, they they find a younger guy, they 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 take him under their wing and say, this is what you need to do to advance your career. And so it's just what men do. But that was all destroyed. But an awful lot of men wouldn't actually understand if you were trying to tell them anyway. Yes. Because it sounds so far-fetched, doesn't it? Uh, In this day and age. It actually not anymore. Oh, good. Because the that that's my story is becoming much. My type of story is becoming much more common now. Uh, and people are, are are I think people, especially in higher higher education, are waking up to to this to this reality. Uh, that the higher education system is, is toxic. Uh, it's toxic towards men, and that they're and that these the lunatics are in charge of the asylum. That there's this ideology called feminism, and that and that they operate as as you said, much like Stalinist Russia. Mm-hmm. You don't go. You don't. You don't speak against the ideology. You don't. You don't dare question it. And, it, and if if you do, you're done. You're destroyed. It's not just enough that you lose your job. You can never get another job in the business or – and even better yet, and what, what, I, what they actually did is they altered my employee file to make it look that I had done – make it look like I had done an, an unsatisfactory job. That becomes a matter of public – and I didn't, again, I didn't realize this until at least a year and a half after looking for a job and I, I didn't understand why it was so hard for me to get a job and someone said, hey, look, you need to go look at your employee file. Mm-hmm. You need to go ask for it and sure enough, it was just totally trash. I had no idea that they had done, that she had done this, but that's what happened. It's not it's, she; it's yeah, they. It's yeah, and it's like, and I'm like, why? What is this? I can't even get a job, a, a job, an entry level job as a, as a as a researcher at it's some government contractor in in D.C. when they when they were hiring like crazy during the, the second Gulf War. Why? Why can't I do this? It's because of this. You you go and you sign the release. You think everything's okay. It's like what you know. What could possibly happen? Well, what they do is they call your employer. They look at your public, and and your your life is destroyed. Yes, it's terrible. So like I went through this terrible dark period in my life, where I, uh, I, I, I say dark period. It was it was it was dark, but it was a it was, it was awakening at the same time. I I moved down to, to Alexandria, Virginia, where I live now. I've been here for mm-hmm. about 10 years now. Mm-hmm. And um, I was poor, no car, underemployed, tr- tr- ghastly underemployed, and um, uh, working part-time for the same production company I work now, the Capital Steps. They're a 
political satire group, and I've mm-hmm. been a soundman for them for over twenty years. But they, but it's only part time, and it's, it's labile. Like I couldn't really count on it. And um, so I started bussing tables, and uh, and. I was just – I felt so defeated. I was like, why am I busing tail? I'm a 33-year-old man who, who educated. Why the heck am I doing it? But at the same time, it was just this incredible it – was, it was a learning experience. It was a um, – Yes. I learned, thing about, I learned things about myself. And something, something happened to me during that time. I, I, uh, I, I started seeing things for how they really were and there was, there's a freedom associated with that. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I let go of so many things. I yeah. I knew that my life was never going to be the same, so I said, "But I'm I'm still alive," mm-hmm. and some it was. I started riding a bicycle everywhere. That was a huge. That was almost a spiritual experience for me. Uh, it's a very mm-hmm. important part of my life, and um, and I found a new way of living. Uh, I I I stopped. I, I realized that wait a minute, I can be poor and still be happy. And there's no way to go but up, and it, and so I, I was promoted from busboy to waiter. <laughs> it started making more money, and I, I was working at this 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 place. It was right around the corner from where I lived, and it was the funnest job I ever had in my entire life. It was it was gloriously fun. Um, uh, it was a hard job, like any job that's worth having. Uh, but uh, I remember there were there were days. It was it's like I, I found this new life. I, I I had money in my pocket after after years of not having money in my pocket and I had enough to live Mm -hmm. and I was, I was happy. Um, even though there was no like future, I started actually questioning what, what does this mean? What does this word future mean? And what is this business where I have to be this? I questioned this, this entire validation of manhood idea, this whole thing. See, I think that's so interesting because I think that's the new, I think this is something radical feminists never, ever considered, that men would, in great numbers, wake up and for the first time in history actually look at why that they should be shackled to the concept of service. Right. Exactly. And that's what happened. It was like – and it was just – it was an incredible time for me. Um, Mm. My – actually, interestingly enough Mm – my sex life improved tremendously. <laughs> it's like, and it was like, it was just like, you're a man in your early thirties, and you don't, you don't have a career. And here I'm, I'm living in Washington D.C., which is a career town. It's like yes. it's a lovely place. Yes. <laughs> everybody, first thing anybody asks you is, what do you do for a living? You better be a lobbyist, or you better be a staffer on Capitol Hill, or you better be working for the military, or even better yet, an officer in the military, or else you're just some sort of loser. And that's the way it is here. But it, I didn't, for me, but you, but, but, yeah, I was, you were in my mind. Yeah, you, different place altogether and yeah because you were a free man looking at yes. them and, and they it, were and enslaved it, yes and it it showed and yeah. um um it just so, so now you're just, beginning to grow yes and so but at that time i had um i uh I, I did eventually find a white collar job working for an association on K Street as a uh, as the statistical manager for an association, and it was I was happy to get at the time I was happy to get behind a desk. Eventually, I became absolutely miserable after working physical labor, uh, mm-hmm. both as a as a as a production guy and um, as a, uh, a, a wait staff. Um, I I discovered that um, the body does not is not suited for sitting at a desk 40 hours a week. <laughs> so you maybe, know, maybe that's the truth for all men. How I think it's men? true for everybody. I think it's, I think, yeah. I think we're built for physical exercise. I, I, I know that even if I do get another desk job, it's going to be, I'll always have, and I never will. I'll always, I'll always have some kind of part-time job where I'm doing something physical. Um, so, but anyway, I, uh, I, uh, I, at that time, I had I had come to realize after all this my life experience I, I realized that there was that there was a problem that there was that we had this ideology that was that had taken over our education system yes uh, that it had destroyed that it, it had created this this huge problem with our family course because again throughout all this time seeing all my friends what they were going through with divorce and how families were getting ripped apart by the family court system. Mm-hmm. What was going on? I mean, everything was was coming to a head. I was seeing what was going on with the criminal justice system, with the Violence Against Women Act, and I just knew something was wrong. But at that time, this is around two thousand eight. 
I wasn't I was like is anything is anybody talking even then it's like in in normal conversation it was something you didn't talk about yeah so even now in mix in, in mixed company I don't I, I don't I don't talk about what I do for activism in, in, when I'm in mixed company now if you get to know me of course I'm, I'm not, I'll never stop talking about it yeah but um but it's just it's not something that you can that 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 you advertise when you're walking down the street they have any more I think than anybody can advertise whatever they do but anyway um so I was kind of like searching around for – there's about a six-month period where I was searching around. I was like, is anybody else talking about this? Is anybody else doing anything about this? Or just, just is anybody else talking about this? Uh, is there a place where people can – is there like something going on where where people are, are challenging these ideas and are free to speak their mind about these things without having to worry? And I stumbled across a site called antimissionary.com. <laughs> And it really – it changed my life. Uh, for the first time, I saw an online forum where people could freely express their thoughts on these matters and freely criticize feminism and show it out for what it is. And it was like I, – I knew then that um, um, that I would be involved after, after about maybe six months of – of hanging out at antimissionary.com, I, I knew that that I was going to spend the rest of my life doing some kind of men's rights activism. Uh, it was a that was again that was another awakening moment, um, and I knew that uh, I knew that my social life was never going to be the same, and it wasn't. Uh, I knew that my 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 family life may never be the same, it hasn't. Um, but it's been. But you're uh, free. I'm free, and in, seriously, since that time. Uh, I I wouldn't I wouldn't trade the experience of becoming a men's rights activist for the world. It is really Well no, but I do think what you've told us today for any man or woman reading this on YouTube and hearing it and what you've been through, I think you have done an enormous amount just today to liberate other men because yes. they need to follow and hopefully because you had to suffer so much and lose so much, hopefully It'll become easier and easier to be honest and be able to talk about what's going on. I'm enormously grateful to you. Do you have something you want to say? Because I think we have to close now. But do you have something you want to leave everybody thinking about? Actually, I'm really glad that you that you said that because what, what we were just talking about I think is a very important thing to say. The number one job, I think, of anybody who's in this movement mm – -hmm. um, and we're not a proselytizing movement. This is, we're, this is not an ideology that we have that we've got going on here. But it's important to spread the red pill around. It's important to – you've got in, – in normal conversation, when you meet new people or talk, talk with people about these issues, and they're everywhere. You, I mean you just look around you, this whole feminism thing. It's, it's in the air we breathe. You, you have to point things out and you have to, you, have to, you have to spread the word. And our number one job is to do that. At this point, it's our number one job. And I found that when you just – if you're just honest and you, you point out facts – you see the light bulb going off of people's heads. I think more and, and more. Yeah, more and I more. agree. And it's yeah. and I and I think I'm so proud to uh, to have been part of, of a voice for America because I think that we've I think that really especially in the past year I really think that we've cracked the nutshell. I agree. Uh, and and I think after this it's there's no going back for feminism. Uh, Thank no you so much, Robert. That's brilliantly put. Thank you. <laughs> Thank I'm you very for very grateful for you giving us your time. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I really really appreciate Bless it. You nice know. talking with you again. You too. All right, everybody. We will see you here again next week at this time on Tales from the Infrared, where we'll be talking video games and geek culture and all that stuff. And Aaron and I will be back here again in two weeks. Um, everybody, again, remember, please check out and spread the word about whiteribbon.org. It's not going away anytime soon. And we're here to change the narrative on what the culture believes. Anyway, bless you, Aaron, um, Thank and you. thanks you, Bob, and uh, you. James, take us home, please. You have been listening to When Did You Wake Up with Aaron Pitsy. We would like to thank James Huff, Paul Elam, and the A Voice for Men community for their support of this show. If you like what you hear and would like to continue to hear more, donations can be made on the front page of A Voice for Men. That's 
avoiceformen.com. Our theme music is Space 1990B by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. That's I-N-C-O-M-P-E-T-E-C-H.com. And is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution License 3.0. And will be noted in the show notes on YouTube. Thank you for listening.